Hello and welcome to the Cookbook Circle podcast. I'm Hannah. And I'm Victoria. And we've set out to review the UK's most popular cookbooks, those that you probably have at home and haven't opened in a while. We take one cookbook each episode to cook from and to stress test, digging out their best recipes, bringing them to life again, and hopefully inspiring you to do so too. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Victoria, from grey, rainy London. Yeah, I mean, look, we had our summer last week, so it's fine. <laughs> We're done now. For all of you non-British listeners, look, this is literally what British people do. They will talk about the weather. It's not. It's, it's not a joke. It's not a. It's no. not a stereotype. Like we do. And the Irish are worse because it will rain like three hundred and fifty days of the year, <laughs> but we'll still talk about how much it's raining. <laughs> What you been up to? What have you been loving in life? I spoke a couple of episodes ago about our favourite foodie emails that we yeah. both love. But I've also been listening to a couple of foodie podcasts that I think that our Ooh. listeners will probably enjoy as well. The first one does not need any introduction. <laughs> probably the bonding point of our friendship. <laughs> I think we were sitting in the office and you started talking about it and recommended it to me and I hadn't really listened at all. And then since then I've been hooked on that is the famous off menu Woo-hoo. Woo. also shout out to our friend paula who i think told me about that podcast yes and said i would like it so i'm forever indebted to her and there and therefore you are <laughs> it's a chain of gratitude <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know it and i i don't think that there will be many of our listeners who don't know it it's presented by james acaster and ed gamble two very funny men who vic and i both <laughs> adore a little bit too much <laughs> i think we both said that it's our ultimate goal to be on that podcast but they need to figure out how to interview two people at once and once they've done that we're there yeah because we certainly don't have the same opinions about what we would choose no that would be two very separate meals they interview different guests and they talk about their favorite starter main course dessert side dish drink um there's also a very famous pop dumps or bread question and it's just it's just hilarious it's great yeah. it's random it doesn't always stay on food i think a couple of my favorite episodes have been the irish comedian ashling b was great so was monia chihuahua that was amazing that, that was so funny it's just bloody great so if you haven't listened to off menu definitely definitely give it a go please that's one and then another one that I've been listening to is Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith. Yeah. Who is a very experienced food writer and journalist and podcast presenter and producer. And she interviews different chefs based on their latest cookbook. And they pick four kind of food moments from each of these books. But it's just so great because she is an excellent interviewer and just really gets loads of detail and emotion and everything out of each of the chefs. I listened to the Raymond Blanc one the other day. Sorry for not saying that in a more French accent. (laughs) he makes up for that in droves Blanc Blanc Raymond Blanc (laughs) and he's I mean I love him a lot anyway just so inspiring to listen to and he talks about his mum passing away recently which was just really emotional he was really close to her and he has loads of passion for apples and pears and he talks about how he's been working on a book for years around that so for like kind of deep dives into chefs and their books and their passions cooking the books with Jilly Smith is really really good um, would highly recommend. Lovely. There are a lot more that would definitely get shout outs like Lecker. There's a new one with Grace Dent called Comfort Eating, which looks really good, but I haven't listened to yet. So watch the space. Maybe we'll do a round two of, of next podcast that we love. And I feel like we mention stuff as we go. Like we talked about the Spook Ford and we talked about, I always talk about BBC Good Food podcast, which I love. Yeah. There's so many out there. Listen to them all. But stay listening to this one. <laughs> yeah most importantly stay here we need you but podcasts is what we're doing not what we're talking about today <laughs> oh look at that segue <laughs> someone get me on the one show um, <laughs> we have a new cookbook to talk to you guys about we are moving away from aussie chefs we've done two aussie chefs in a row aussie chefs <laughs> Two Aussie chefs in a row. And now we're we're back in America. So the book we're talking about this episode is, John Roll, please. <laughs> the the French, French Laundry. Laundry by Thomas Keller with a restaurant of the same name in California. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tom, as we'll call him. Yeah. 
Come on. <laughs> Let me firstly remind everyone what our podcast is all about, what we do really quickly. So we curated a list to end all lists of all the best cookbooks in the world, basically. So all the lists that you find, you know, over Christmas or like best 25 ever cookbooks, we collated all of those and made them into our own big list. And we are taking the top ones of those lists, so the ones that came up on again and again and again. We read them, we cook from them, we review them, and then we give you our lovely cookbook circle rating, which we'll tell you more about later. So this episode's one that's gone through the mill is The French Laundry by Thomas Keller. Very fine dining. So fine dining. I, I, I don't know if our kind of reluctance is coming across here. It definitely did when we were introducing it at the end of the last episode, but I think we were both a bit terrified of this one. We'll get into that. I'll save some of this. Tell me about Tom. <laughs> Oh, Tom. Tommy. Thanks for everything. So, Mr. Thomas Keller, he is America's most decorated chef. Oh. He has won every single award that you could possibly want to win. So, he's currently in his 60s. Yeah. And, yeah, his his mom was a restaurateur, which okay. I thought was interesting. So, that's when he... I don't think she was a chef. I think she owned a restaurant and he would help out when her chefs weren't well or weren't in or stuff like that. So that's when he like started getting cooking. Okay. Um, but when he really got into it was he moved to Florida after his mom got divorced. And in the summers, he would start cooking at this yacht club. As he did. You can see where we're going with this. <laughs> so then so he started cooking at, the, at this yacht club every summer and he could get into food, learning how to, you know, all the, all the things you need to do to learn how to cook. And then then he seems to like it's a very strange like you read all these stories about how he how, how he kind of moved around mm. he then ended up in a golf club kitchen in Rhode Island which is very far from <laughs> from Florida <laughs> I don't know how, but yeah, so that is when he met Roland Hennin. Again, sorry if that isn't French enough. Uh, but he's a French-born chef who apparently is master chef, amazing guy. The original master chef, is it? Did he win the competition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an honour to meet you, Roland. <laughs> He firstly won the amateurs and now, then he won the <laughs> professionals. <laughs> yeah, so he met this guy who, yeah, apparently is this great chef who taught him about French cooking, like introduced him and taught him about the French cooking. So thanks, Roland. I didn't know that the French cooked. Is that a thing there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite little known. I think it's quite niche. Yeah. So that's why uh, Thomas they decided he could go into it probably wasn't enough french restaurants in the east coast of america at that time so <laughs> so then he again he was like up and down the east coast of america cooking in various places mm. a bit strange i imagine he's rich i guess this is the thing i imagine he was wealthy <laughs> and so could just do what he wanted yeah i think this is a thing though like especially in i'm gonna say especially in the states because that's i've read kitchen confidential <laughs> and like the anthony Bourdain <laughs> traveled around so much like that and he would I think he started in like Maine or somewhere like that in like a seaside town and quite a rough kitchen by the sounds of it but then yeah he you know gets fired or he walks out of a job because he's sick of it or the season's over or something and then he'll know some random chef in like a totally different part of the country and then just goes and starts working with them yeah. so I think it's just like connections just like like just bounce around yeah. yeah well then he bounced after that to France Aww. of course went to Paris he went to work slash intern slash stage, I guess, in various Michelin starred restaurants in Paris, uh -huh. where I guess he honed his craft, etc. Came back to the States. <laughs> the, uh, the distaste is dripping from that. <laughs> no. Like we said, cooking the books with Jilly Smith, that's your place to go for deep dives into these lovely chefs. <laughs> Here's where we take a piss out of them relentlessly. <laughs> Back to the States, opened a restaurant called Rackel. 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 Oh. Yeah, R A K A L. Oh. Rackel. <laughs> in New York okay. and that was fine but he eventually left because it was kind of it wasn't far from Wall Street and the market crashed and I think it was just turning into a kind of standard run of the mill like bistro style restaurant and he that is not his style he yeah. wanted to go and spread his French wings <laughs> and <laughs> love life 
So he left. And then he finds this this little place in Yountville, California. I hope I'm saying that right. Which is in the kind of Napa Valley region. So north of San Francisco, which is currently being used as a restaurant, but has this really fascinating history. So this is the French Laundry, the restaurant, okay. which ends up being the French Laundry. Right. What Before it was a restaurant, it was... A laundry. A French laundry. Ah, yeah. No way. I was so yeah, right. yeah. It was a literally, a literal French laundry. It's this really old, for America, a building that we used to be a saloon. And then... Wow. Prohibition came in, so it closed down and it wasn't doing anything for a while. And then, yeah, and then they made it into a French laundry. And then the mayor of the town took it over to make it into a restaurant with his wife. Wow. But, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of it, but it's a really beautiful building. Yeah. It's kind of old, almost looks like, I want to say like Tuscan or something. Yes. Those like nice California vibes. Yeah. Question. Mm. What's the difference between a French laundry and a normal laundry? I don't know. I guess it, it's it's maybe a way of starching shit. I don't know. <laughs> I'm interested. Maybe it's just, uh, just very fancy laundry. Yeah, maybe there isn't. Maybe it was just called that and to make it sound fancy yeah and it was just a laundromat <laughs> but i don't know so he raises all this money from friends and and associates or whatever that's how he knows rich he's got people that can raise money to turn this this restaurant into a fine dining restaurant which he does it becomes the french laundry he owes a lot i think to the, the couple that were running it as a restaurant and they're mentioned in this book i don't know if you i think it's the schmitz ah. yeah because i think they they wanted it to just be lovely and brilliant they were like a bit reticent about handing it over but obviously it worked out yeah so he turns the French Laundry into this French restaurant, but with like a hint of American kind of ness and classics. So like in this book, it talks about like peanut butter truffles yeah. and there's like a grilled cheese style thing, but it's all very high end. Yeah, so high end that puts those, those dish names in like inverted commas or like air quotes yeah. doesn't he because ha 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 imagine that I would call yeah. something as common as fish and chip when it's actually <laughs> yeah. you know like it's, like, it's mullet with a, it's pan yeah, fried exactly. yeah with garlic chips yeah. right like nobody wants to eat that please no people do want to eat that that's why this is the most famous restaurant in America <laughs> So it's been open for like over 20 years now. It's won every mm. award possible. He is very, all the articles always say about him, he's very into like the emotional side of eating and food wow. and how it's not just about the eating the thing. It's about kind of crying afterwards, creating this memory. <laughs> yeah. It's about looking at your bank account after you've either eaten his restaurant or cooked any of his recipes and being like, fuck it up. On that dinner at the French Laundry currently costs uh, $355 for nine courses. Bargain. And you can choose either with meat or the, I think it's called a feast of vegetables or some shit. <laughs> and that includes gratuity, but does not include extras such as caviar and truffles. Damn. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it would also want to include my flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or wine, which I suppose, you know, is the whole other ball game. Yeah, exactly. That's probably another easy, like 300 quid on top. Exactly. I read a, an article or or a thing about how they were renovating a few years ago. So they celebrated their 20 year anniversary and then they were renovating. And whilst they were renovating, half a million dollars worth of wine was stolen from their <gasps> wine cellar. Oh my God. Yeah. Someone had a great night after that. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's the French Laundry. Thomas Keller is obviously incredibly famous, like I said. So he is the only chef, I think, ever to have had three Michelin stars on two restaurants at the same time. Yeah. So this one, the French Laundry, and then he opened an East Coast version called Per Se. Yes. And they both had three stars. And then at one point, I think he had seven stars. He had another restaurant which had a, a one star. So wow. he's no big deal, you know. And now we're going to add the cookbook circle rating yeah. on top of that. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure he'll be, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty huge. <laughs> he's got James Beard Awards. He's got Michelin stars. He's got everything. And he's, it was in the best 50 restaurants in the world. But this one's the one. We've got you, Tommy. Big news for you about Tom Keller. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Tommy boy. Hit me. He was the chef consultant on Ratatouille. <gasps> Oh. Yeah. And so did you see the Ratatouille style thing in this book? Yeah, briefly. Which I can't remember the name of, but it has a different name. He created that especially for Ratatouille. So the producer, I think, or some people came and interned at the French Laundry under him. Oh my God. Before going out to do Ratatouille. And he created that dish, that fancy Ratatouille <gasps> for it. And he's your guy. Wow. I know. 
he must have adapted it because this book was in 1999. I don't oh, know yeah, when yeah. Ratatouille came out. But maybe, so maybe, yeah, he's, he created a posh version of it yeah. for the Ratatouille. But it does look like when you, in the picture of this, it does look like it. Yeah. Um, I thought you'd enjoy that little snippet. Okay, he's majorly gone up in my estimations then. <laughs> That's big brownie points, Tommy boy. <laughs> and my exciting thing was, obviously lots of really great chefs have trained under him, but... He also trained Rene Redzepi from Noma, uh, just who I love. Yes. Yeah. So that's exciting, I thought. Yeah. And obviously, Rene Redzepi is not, he doesn't do French food. He just does like amazing produce, like yeah. does incredible shit with food. It's more about like ingredients that he grows at Noma and stuff, right? Like, yeah. And stuff that he would never eat anywhere else. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. The book, just quickly, I don't have much about the book. I wanted to find a little bit more about the book, but I couldn't. It came out in 1999. It's been printed over 400,000 times. I think it's got a few editions. Hmm. It's very beautiful. Like, like we mentioned at the end of last time's episode episode like it's square so it's not like any of the other books that we've got it's quite big it's quite square it's obviously meant to be like a coffee table book but the reviews that came out at the time and then since just consistently say the stuff is too hard to do at home like it's not for a home cook really like and he's tried i think to to make it into something that that could be and but that's what the the reviews say which i was very happy about because that's obviously how i think and you wonder like you know not to discredit our list because our list is everything it's the bible but like how how does it keep ending up on these best job mm. lists when it's really just very inaccessible? Yeah, it's a reference book, I think. Yeah, it feels totally. like a reference book. I should say, I don't know if you felt like this reading through it. So it's it's a mixture of it's got lots of recipes, but then it's like interspersed with like pros and information about producers mm. and things like that. And it reminded me so much of Momofuku, the yes. book. Yes, I felt like it. The structure and the writing was almost identical. And then I read that David Chang put this book as an Thomas Keller is one of his inspirations and I was like it all becomes that's how <laughs> that's how it will do it yeah I was about to make a sweeping generalization about professional American chefs and their writing style so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that we linked those two up before I did that <laughs> <laughs> So how do you feel about this book? What did you think? What were your first impressions? Uh, I, <laughs> big sigh. It's very beautiful, <laughs> like we said. And, and yeah, it is a coffee table book. And I never read coffee table books. <laughs> you just like pick them up once and leaf through them. And that's it. They sit there unused. And I feel like, sorry to give an early, early like conclusion. But I think that's what's going to happen with this book for me. When I was leafing through, it's impossible to find anything. You know how I like a cop out dish. With, I've now <laughs> coined my... Yeah. cookbook circle cop out dish of the episode but I think I found one in here but like it barely exists everything has multiple steps the kind of ingredients are broken down similar to Momofuku into almost like little recipes of their own so you have to have yeah. like you know you do this to the asparagus and you do this to the bloody you have a balsamic glaze or whatever but what struck me as I was going through is just like I don't feel like these have been and maybe that's the thing right but these haven't been adapted for a home cook in any way there's not even really kind of alternatives of like what you could use at home if you don't have equipment or if you can't find the ingredients for me it's almost like a, a literal transcription of whatever their recipe kind of bible is in house like in a restaurant you have loads of space you have equipment you make things in bulk and then you it, like it sits there for a week and you you or like however many days and you use it for multiple dishes and multiple recipes yeah. and you've got like piles of you know vegetables chopped up ready to go or lemons squeezed and I don't feel like he's like I've said he hasn't adapted that for the home cook you're still doing things at like a big scale or like yeah or ridiculously you're doing things that should be done at scale in a smaller scale and it doesn't quite make sense and they're maybe not going to keep so I just felt like it wasn't accessible in any way for the home cook yeah and I mean I'm, I'm sure that there's a niche of people who would really enjoy that I don't know any. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just, for me, it's not my style of cooking or the kind of food that I aspire to. I don't love fine dining, I'll be honest. No. Like, I, I would, if I'm going out for food, I would prefer to just have, like, really mid-range or, like, great fast food as well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I don't think in my lifetime I would, no matter how rich I get from this podcast, that I'll ever <laughs> just, just drop, like, 300 quid on a, one meal. I just don't. 
I don't think it's worth it. You still eat it and your expectations are so high. It can, it's really hard to meet them. I think also it like fine dining generally and books like this obviously rely so heavily on you finding the very best of an ingredient. Yeah. And that is just not accessible to anybody day to day. Like I, I can't go out and find restaurant quality produce to buy two tomatoes or whatever it is, right? Like yeah. that's impossible for me. And like people around the world and, and in, definitely in America, like it's all just industrialized food, right? So it's yeah. not, this isn't ever going to taste, which is the point, right? It's never going to taste like what it tastes like at the French Laundry because like you say, you do, we don't have the precise ovens with all sorts of thermometers in it. We don't have the produce. We don't have the time. We don't have the equipment. We don't trained in Paris so it's it feels a bit I have for me like a bit used oh I mean you have but not wow. as a chef <laughs> not as a like sorry a Tom <laughs> as a pastry chef but we'll come to that later as well yeah so I just feel like I can't get ingredients that will do these recipes justice in my supermarket yeah it, like you said I was very stressed leaf, leafing through it yeah. like what the fuck am I going to cook how am I going to find this stuff like there's so there's like obviously there's a whole truffle section you think I'm going to peel a tomato like you've got something else to think about because like that sounds very stressful to me there's a lot of peeling tomatoes yeah I mean we'll come to talk about it but I cut a lot of corners me too I made a lot of substitutions yeah same and I think he does that classic thing of like um taking some things for granted you know in in your knowledge that thinking that you mm. will know that to, how to peel a tomato like like instead of just mm. saying like fucking blanch it for a minute in boiling water and the skins come right off instead you're sitting there wondering like yeah do I have to sit and peel a tomato like an absolute knob like it's just yeah it's not it's not of the people no it's not of the people and and you're right like yeah some of the recipes just call for like a teaspoon of something but it's like well there's the rest of that thing to do yeah yeah so yes yeah, if you're like if you're anything like us don't buy this book I think I mean I'm saying that off the bat maybe we'll cut it out but I just think if you want to have a joyful time yeah co home cooking this isn't this isn't the book if you want a lovely book for your guests to look at on your coffee table and you like muted colors then it's because there's not that many pictures of the food in here in there either oh, no like, there isn't they're all quite small yeah <laughs> we know how you like a picture i know and uh, to be honest i really could have done with you know a reference picture for what these things could look like yeah like on this page there's a picture of just some empty cups i don't know why <laughs> i don't know why that's what your 400 dollars gets you <laughs> Anyway. Anyway. Shall we get into it? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. What did you cook, Hannah? I suspect that we maybe have made the same thing. Vic and I, we never really tell each other what we're going to make, but we have talked a little bit about this being like, we're only doing two things because <laughs> this is ridiculous. I mean, even two is a push, I think. Yeah. Like, we were originally thought we'd only do one, but... Here we are. We might both managed to do two. But the first one was quite easy, and it was, it was very hot here this week, like we said, so... Um, I made the gazpacho. Oh, no, I didn't make the gazpacho. Oh, I was sure that you had. No. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay. So, yeah, the gazpacho is relatively simple in the general kind of theme of this book. So you've got, okay, one little rant again before we start. <laughs> Even in this most fine dining restaurant, it, like in the US, they still use fucking cups. I honestly cannot oh, yeah cope with cups as a measurement like it's just ridiculous like, so in this it's like a cup of red onions a cup of green bell pepper a cup of english cucumber all chopped obviously you're not trying to wedge a cucumber into a cup <laughs> a cup of down. peeled and chopped <laughs> A cup of tomatoes. And it's just like, no, just tell me what, what that means. So I literally was just like, okay, that's one big red onion, one green pepper, one, you know, like two thirds of a big yeah. cucumber. Like just fucking say it as it is. It's so frustrating to me. And in the beginning, I don't know if you read this, he, he talks about like, whatever, like this book and here, whatever. He talks about like how to get the best out of this book. And then he talks about, oh, I've put volume measurements in, but you should learn to use a scale. It's like, how is anyone going to learn to use a scale? scale if you're putting everything in cups learn to use it's literally pressing on i don't it's, it's, <laughs> I don't, I don't. 
I don't need a lesson in it. You need a lesson in weighing things better, Tom. Yeah, uh, well, uh, surely, like, nobody in the French laundry restaurant is, like, there with a cup measurement. You know, they're mincing red onions and then, like, levelling off a cup of them. Like, of course not. Anyway, deep breath. Okay, so you you chop all those things. <laughs> this is, and then it all, it all just goes into a bowl with some garlic salt, um, quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne, quarter of a cup of tomato paste, white wine vinegar, <laughs> some quarter of a fucking <laughs> cup of olive oil <laughs> tablespoon of lemon juice could you just say half a lemon please um, three cups of tomato juice and a sprig of thyme and all of that goes into a bowl and into the fridge overnight and it just sits there and gets to know each other and then you blitz it the next day mm. and you are meant to pass it through like a sieve or a chinois or whatever of course but then he, he says something like oh you'll have about two quarts and then when you what does that mean I don't know what I've, it's a thing two um, quarts of what <laughs> Like, what is it a quart of? Two quarts makes a whole. A pound? <laughs> a gallon? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But he says for a, for a smoother texture, you can like strain it. And then you get one quart. And I was thinking that's such a waste if, I, if you just lose half. waste, man. So I wasn't going to do that. So I just had it as it was. And it was quite smooth. Speaking of taking liberties, you're meant to serve it with like a balsamic glaze, which is essentially just a ton mm. of balsamic reduced down. I mean, you could definitely do it in a pot, but he says to do it in some kind of ridiculous thing, kind of contraption. You can buy that shit in a supermarket, right? Well, we had some in the cupboard, see? And you know, oh, great. See, Filippo Berrio or whoever had done all that work yeah. in reducing the balsamic. Who am I to take away from them? You literally just chisel a little bit of that on. I did a really shit swirl, actually. You'll see in the photo. It's really like 90s cuisine. <laughs> and that's it. But actually, I have to say, it's very good. Mm. It is very, very good. I wouldn't have been really a fan of cold soups or anything before. There's one in Seville where I used to live called Samarejo, which is like tomatoes, really ripe tomatoes and bread bread and olive oil and that oh, one's nice. amazing but I've always kind of dismissed gazpacho as like just a bit watery just like who wants like tomato juice yeah may as well have a bloody mary <laughs> like. yeah oh that's what I'll do with the rest <laughs> Vodka point. I had a great Bloody Mary this last weekend with sriracha in it Ooh. instead of Tabasco, and it was so good. That is so good. Have you had it with horseradish sauce in before? That's really good as well. No, I don't think so. I love a Bloody Mary. Yeah, just me to too. Say. I mean, he does say in this to not think of gazpacho as a soup, but to think of it as a sauce. So now we're taking it one step further and thinking of it as a cocktail. <laughs> it's, a, it's a drink. <laughs> so yes, I actually would recommend that to people as a, if Ooh. you're feeling like gazpacho this recipe we'll try to find it online we'll put it on the website just don't buy the book it's fine <laughs> for that one recipe. yeah it's fine liked that a lot mm. and the second thing i made was in the dessert section oh did you make any desserts no i thought about it but huh. yeah i like the look of a couple of things and then i chickened out because they look scary it was yeah it was a little bit scary and i will tell you why the dish was called the lemon sabayon pine nut tart with honeyed mascarpone cream Ooh. so i love a lemon tart anyway yeah and this is a slightly different take on it in that you make a sabayon which i'll come to but first of all the pastry absolute <sighs> nightmare oh no but what's what's different about this pastry is you blitz up pine nuts oh i mean obviously i had to um you know use my life savings to buy a little bag of them but, <laughs> yeah. and also the the quantity for this pastry is three times what you need and he says because you use a third of an egg it wouldn't make sense to cut the recipe but i would rather use a third of an egg than three times of pine nuts yeah and be you know on the street next month bankrupt yourself yeah just you know pimp up your next omelet like well, you can definitely reuse two thirds of an egg anyway so you blitz <laughs> pine nuts and then you you add in some flour sugar he does this, all this in a food processor i use like effectively a youtube bullet and then you mix through butter softened butter again quite unusual in that you're using room temperature butter rather than cold which you would usually use for pastry so it makes it even more difficult to work with yeah and it's been so hot it's been so hot the pine nuts when they're blitzed just release loads you know it's really fatty then you've got this soft mm. butter it was honestly like it was so soft that i just thought oh my God, this is never going to work. And then he says to put it in the fridge for at least 10 minutes. 
uh, like even with co- when you're using cold butter, you would put it in the fridge for like at least half an hour. So I just I don't know if there's something I was missing there. Anyway, it was really soft. I wrapped it up in cling film, put it in the fridge for like a couple of hours, and then it was slightly easier to work with. But he um he doesn't roll it out or anything by the sounds of it. He's just like you just use your fingertips to press the chill dough evenly over the bottom of the tin and up the sides. So maybe that's why, but it's still, it's just very hard to work with. Weird. And it was really hot. It was just melty everywhere. So the the pastry ended up way thicker than I wanted it to. And yeah, I don't personally think that the pine nuts bring a lot. But anyway, we'll just move on to the more positive part of the recipe. (laughs) You did it and that's what's important. Yeah, I've got a big old like biscuit base in there. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so then you make a sabayon, which is like bring a pot of water to the boil and then you get a bowl and put that over it and you put in eggs, egg yolks, sugar and you kind of whisk them a little bit before it goes on the heat actually. And then you put it over the heat and you keep kind of whisking it so it's effectively kind of cooking or making almost an airier custard um mm. and you've got some lemon juice and you you put that in in steps and after that's all kind of quite thick and you can see like the trail of the whisk in it you you turn off the heat but you leave it on the pan of water and you add in some butter of course oh. yeah <laughs> classic french vibe to france <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then you that you just kind of mix through the butter until it melts so then you've got this really lovely like silky kind of custardy lemon thing uh, which is just actually really delicious on its own to be fair but obviously quite rich and then you spread that on the I say on the tart base he says in the tart base because mine was just like it didn't have much of a dip because <laughs> it was just so impossible to work with and I <laughs> oh god it was just whatever so you, you spread it into the tart shell and then you actually put it under the grill and you toast oh. the top I toasted mine probably a fraction of a second too long <laughs> I was kind of laughing when I looked back at the photo and then I looked at mine uh, because they did not look the same and then <laughs> uh, you let it sit at like room temperature for an hour he recommends that you eat it at room temperature and you make like a honeyed mascarpone cream so you just whisk up some Ooh. cream and a couple of tablespoons of mascarpone and a tablespoon of honey and you serve that alongside it it was very good obviously I just was kind of sad about the pastry and that was a bit thicker than I would have liked but in general, the flavor was really nice. And I was thinking just like, if I ever want to make a lemon tart again, which I will, typically it's quite like a curdy filling, right? Yeah. I would much rather do something like this, which feels a lot lighter. It's almost like kind of moussey. And it, oh, nice. The curd filling sometimes can be a bit much, be a bit rich. So I thought this was a way nicer alternative. But like, if you wanted to just buy like a pastry shell, which I absolutely would do, and especially in summer, and then just do the sabayon step and put that in and toast it under the Grim. yeah that's not that labor intensive and it's a really nice result so it was good but I'll just never make that pastry again <laughs> yeah I mean you know how I feel about making pastry but I, I also know how about you how you feel about making pastry yeah it sounds uh and our old friend pine nuts rears its ugly expensive head again I don't love a pine nut it's not my favorite of the peanuts it's I feel <laughs> <laughs> like they're quite nice in a salad or something when you can taste them. But I feel like blitzed up in a in a dough. What do they bring? Yeah, and I think they you need to toast them to get some flavour. Otherwise, they're a bit like <laughs> like a bit like styrofoamy or something. <laughs> How's it go? <laughs> <laughs> That was what I cooked. What did you cook, Victoria? So I cooked two things, same as you, like a, a simpler one and then a more complex one. And I just have to say, like I said before, but it's a caveat of all of these things that I just I didn't do or the whole recipe for either of them. Uh, because it, I'm not, I know I'd get annoyed <laughs> about myself and that it had all gone wrong. And so I didn't. But luckily, Susie Hellers, in, she seems to be, she pops yeah. up in this book. Pop up Susie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually like she jumps out at you for on page five to show you. Hi, she looks like one of those holograms in the airport. And she's like, "Welcome to the little French laundry." How much time do you have? How much money do you have? <laughs> yeah. Either way, it's not enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So she's got this about how to use this book. And obviously it's, she wrote it instead of Thomas Keller, which I love. And she's basically like, look, if you don't want to do the whole, like it's hard. If you don't want to do the whole recipe, don't do the whole recipe, like pick and choose. And so I made the cornets, the salmon tartare and sweet with sweet red onion creme fraiche. Oh, wow. Nice. 
But so she says in that page, if you don't want to make the cones, so they're like little, they look like little ice cream cones, yeah. then serve them on toast corners. So I was like, Susie, you're my girl. I know how to make toast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did um, because so yeah she she talks about how you don't have to commit to the whole recipe because they're hard and so that's um, <laughs> I took her advice and ran with that <laughs> through the whole this whole book well played so this is the very first recipe in the book and it seems to be like a little amuse bouche mm-hmm. style thing they can be served like standing up can you eat them sitting down <laughs> no lying down they're exclusively <laughs> a standing up dish so they look like an ice cream cone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently he was inspired by a trip to Baskin Robbins. Oh. And I love Baskin Robbins, as literally probably no one knows, but it is one of my faves. So I was excited by that. Oh. And I read that after the fact. But like I said, mine don't look like ice creams because I served it on toast. So it's very fun, a little recipe. So back to your point about small quantities of things. This for me was just a, a recipe of mincing, mincing tiny amounts of things. Oh. You had to mince some raw salmon, okay. only about 100 grams. Okay. You had to mince a red onion, shallots. I think that was it for the mincing. But for the uh, for the, for the the shallots, you only needed a teaspoon and a half of minced shallots. For the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a bag of shallots. Yeah. And then only needed... Herod of oil. Anyway. So you make the salmon tartare. So you put your minced salmon with some olive oil, your tiny amount of shallots, some chives. You have to mince some chives as well. Again, about, about a teaspoon of chives. Right. And lemon oil but obviously I wasn't gonna buy lemon oil because what am I gonna do with that so I just added some fresh lemon Mm. and extra oil (laughs) and I thought that'll do it it's the same was that lemon and oil you said there Thomas (laughs) yeah done lemon oil brackets sea stockists or whatever it is like and I was like um no no this is not gonna happen so you mix all that up pop it in the fridge leave it for as long as you want up to 12 hours and then for the creme fraiche you buy creme fraiche you don't have to make creme fraiche which is good uh, you whip the creme fraiche up until it's like soft peaks and then just stir in your minced onions but before you put in the minced onions you have to obviously of course rinse drain and like pat them dry with a tea towel so then so you've got those two you pop that in a fridge as well because it feel like it helps it to kind of set and then you make the cones which are much more harder than even read the recipe because i wasn't going to do it but so i put some toast on by putting it in the uh, toaster uh <laughs> so then you put sorry slow down there i'm just writing this down <laughs> So you assemble. So the creme fraiche goes on first and then some tartare. So if it's in a cone, you like shape it into what looks like an ice cream cone. But I didn't do that. Um, And then in the cones, you get one chive tip because you need uh, precisely 24 chive tips for this (laughs) recipe. And that like sticks out the top. But mine was just laid on the top. This is just like a really tired cone that went for a lie down. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah like a stretched out relaxed cone a bit like me i'm a stretched out relaxed cone you know we're all stretched out relaxed cones. <laughs> so that was very easy frankly you know i felt like this book was a book of having tiny little bowls of things in my fridge you know yeah, i felt yeah, like my yeah. fridge was just full of little bowls of you know one and a half fucking tablespoons of shallots <sighs> but it was good Okay. We had it as like a little starter before dinner. Oh. And you, I think you, suppose I put the lemon in it and it has like a lemon oil in it. You maybe expect it to be a bit ceviche-y because yes. it's got that acid, but it's it's not at all. Oh. But it's really delicate, just really lovely. Like it's a oh. perfect like bite, but you probably could have more. I mean, I guess it's like all this stuff. You probably could have more. Yeah. I thought very fancy. I thought the creme fraiche also on its own could just be nice as a little dip, to be honest. Yeah. Nice. Would you make it again? Yeah, maybe. Like if I was trying to be impressive, mm. again, I wouldn't make the cones, but like it was obviously easy on toast. And it was, if I was doing an amuse-bouche style yeah. thing, yeah. then I would, or I had extra <laughs> shallots hanging around all those chive tips hanging around <laughs> so that was that i imagine it's absolutely incredible in the restaurant yeah because again like it's it, like you get the best salmon ever and you know not just buying a supermarket fill it and yeah, chopping yeah, it up yeah, totally so the second thing i made the more like involved thing was the heirloom tomato tart with niçois olive taffinate and basil vinaigrette Ooh. Oh, I saw that and I thought it looked lovely. Did you? Yeah. So again, I didn't make the basil vinaigrette 
A bit like you, because it's mostly balsamic vinegar. Yeah. And, like, and then you have to like blanch and break down some basil. But like, I didn't want to do that. So I decided not to. Um, this is his ode to pizza. I don't know if you read the thing about it. I did not. He says he loves pizza he? and he loves tomatoes. But pizza dough, and I quote, is not elegant enough for the French laundry. <sighs> but puff pastry is. So it's got no cheese in it. It's a tomato tart. So... <laughs> He's trying to talk about how he likes pizza, but does he? Um, <laughs> did I make puff pastry? Did I fuck? Let me tell you. <laughs> what? I am shocked. I thought about it and then I thought, no, I'm going to stay on my my lovely little road of not making pastry. <laughs> but Jesus, if I couldn't make the just regular like short crust in this heat, then like puff pastry would have yeah. been an absolute yeah. nightmare. Thank you. Supermarket pastry yeah so so i didn't make the puff pastry and i didn't make the balsamic vinaigrette but i did put some balsamic on at the end so sorry about that Mm -hmm. even with all of those things i didn't do it is quite the recipe the first thing you do is you make a tapenade which is anchovies that he asks for you find them packed in salt but obviously i couldn't find those so i just bought fancy pants normal ones but then you have to soak six to eight anchovies in milk for an hour three times (laughs) that gave me a physical reaction sorry fishy milk it's it's not the one (laughs) three times what do you do with the milk i'll just pour it away i drink it yeah i I guess it's for the salt i did it anyway because the mine were in like oil so they have to do that that's for an hour so that's three hours of soaking anchovies christ and then you add anchovies the niswa olives obviously i couldn't find niswa olives but kalamata are fine for tapenade so we got those ones <laughs> mustard and olive oil mm-hmm. Nice. Thanks to the mini chopper who did all the work here. You blitz that into a tapenade. It's quite oily. I thought there was too much oil in it. Yeah. It's like kind of separated, but maybe that was my problem. But I love tapenade and I'd never made it before. So that was fun. Yeah. And then you would need five heirloom tomatoes. So I put that on my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> because where did you get them? they're expensive um shout out to eat 17 the posh spa in my oh, yes. where i live in walthamstow which has all this lovely fresh produce and they had some really nice ones oh, lovely yeah i was very happy to get them i wasn't happy to hand over the money for them but <laughs> it's fine so two of those tomatoes you chop into big slices i think he says three per tomato oh. mine got a bit more than that because they're a bit they were quite big. Yeah. And then the other three you slice into smaller slices. The big slices go in the oven with some oil, some salt and pepper, some thyme. Lovely. They go in on a low heat for 45 minutes. So they're kind of dried, yeah. but not roasted. Beautiful. They smelt gorgeous. They were like, honestly, like perfect tomatoes. Like, we know how I feel about tomatoes. Yeah. And so I was a bit worried about this wouldn't taste like anything, but they were amazing. So then you leave them. And then the other tomatoes you put in the fridge on a baking tray with a tea towel with oil salt and pepper right and leave them in the fridge for however long you want so you've got double the amount basically of the raw as you have of the cooked Mm. um you then roll out your puff pastry that you've made uh put that in the freezer put it on a sheet in a freezer and leave that so once that's frozen and your onions are done you cut out circles of the pastry about three inch circles that's the top of a jam jar. So I found out you pop those on a baking tray with the one each of the roasted tomatoes on top. Okay. Right. Just that they then go into the oven for about 25 minutes. Yeah. Nothing else. Just those two things. Okay. So no glare, you know, no like wash or anything. I lost one. RIP. The, <laughs> the tomato popped off when the puff pastry was puffing off. <laughs> so I had like some oh burnt tomato and this, and this puff pastry ring. <laughs> And then, so that they come out, you then put two slices of the raw tomato on top of the on top of the cooked tart because they've all like puffed up and they look lovely. Yeah. Two slices of raw, some tapenade, some greens, mm-hmm. which he tells you how to prepare, but obviously I didn't do that. Um, and then some of the vinaigrette. Okay. So you've got one cooked slice and two raw slices. Yeah, this is why I needed pictures because I was confused. <laughs> I was like, "What? What is this?" Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lot. So it's it's just like a tall tomato tart. It was really nice. It was it was good. So you're supposed to get the the warm of the tart and the roasted tomato, then which contrasts with the cold tomatoes. Yeah. But it's very uneven okay. in the taste. Maybe I didn't slice my raw tomatoes thin enough. Okay, yeah. But it just the taste of the roasted tomato was so lovely. Yes. But then you just got this like cold tomato on top, which maybe it just is like kind of yeah. overpowering. And then you've got you don't have much of the tapenade on each one, like a quarter of a tablespoon. So you can't really 
really taste that. But again, maybe I just sliced it too small, but it's a nice idea. Like the whole, it's a love, and then you'd like drizzle like this basil thing, but I just did balsamic. And yeah, it's it's a nice little starter. Mm. And I would definitely, I think I would do it again, The at least the pastry and the tomatoes, yeah. like the roasted, and the, just roasting the tomatoes like that, just having them there, like just, they were lovely. Yeah. yeah. It was nice. I and mean, it wasn't a pizza, yeah. but it was, <laughs> it was good. And it, it didn't feel, too, when you're in it, it didn't feel too difficult, but it's just like, there's lots of steps and yeah. obviously I cut out a number of the steps. Yeah. Don't you feel like if you just maybe roasted the tomatoes, because that was obviously added a lot of flavour and just had a regular sheet, you know, a full sheet of puff pastry and just like layered up some tomatoes with the tapenade that it would probably just be as nice and less labour intensive. Yeah, exactly. And you could put that in the middle of a table and have it as like a, yeah. even take on a picnic or whatever. Like it, yeah, I agree. But it depends, I guess, what you like. I imagine if the tomatoes were like, the raw ones were like so good and so flavorful. Like yeah. it would be like a real flavor bomb, but it but it wasn't. So so that's what I cooked. Is there anything else that you <laughs> thought you might cook? Not a huge amount, in case you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> there was a English pea soup. Oh, yeah. He specified that the cucumber had to be English in my gazpacho, and obviously his, he likes his peas English as well. That sort of comes with truffle oil and parmesan Ooh. crisps, so I'll be with that. But there was also a dessert that was oven roasted pineapple, but it had fried pastry cream. Yes! Which I was actually quite intrigued by. It, it calls it a pineapple chop, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like a little lamb chop. And the idea of fried pastry cream was just very interesting, so I would love to give that a go to see what that, was, what that would be like. Yeah, I love roasted pineapple as well it just tastes so oh, good. good yeah yeah like on the barbecue or something yeah and then there's a couple of things in the cheese chapter there's like pecorino with roasted peppers and stuff but if i'm completely honest i don't think i'll be coming back to this book very often no um what about you is there anything that you fancy not really i was <laughs> i was gonna cop out and make he has one he talks about staff meal in this and how he at one of these restaurants he was kind of tasked with staff meal and that's how you know that if you're really passionate about cooking and he so basically gives this recipe for a staff meal lasagna yes and I almost made that but I was like this is cheating <laughs> but it's like a veggie lasagna which I there's no meat in yeah, it and it's just fair. I guess it's just lovely leftover yeah it looked lovely but I was like that's cheating if I do the literally the thing that's not meant to be served yeah. I like the, the look of the jellies as well I probably wouldn't ever give them a go but I know that they're a big thing in, in France in France, there were yuzu and cherry or something, yeah. weren't they, with the peanut butter thing. And you needed, like, apple pectin. And I was like, okay, hard pass on that. <laughs> Shall we rate? Yeah, let's rate. I will remind you of our rating system in case you're not familiar with it. So yeah, each book we rate out of five categories. These categories are usability and accessibility. That's one. <laughs> Ingredients used. Are they things that are easy to find or that you'd have to hand? Aesthetics. Does it look nice? Is it veggie friendly? And our newcomer is inspirability. So does this book actually make you want to get in the kitchen and um, spend, you know, all your money on ingredients or your lifetime chain to a stove so, <laughs> and each uh, episode we rate out of something different unique to that chef or to the cookbook so for uh, Simon Hopkinson go back old here again <laughs> we did out of calf's brains for Stephanie Alexander and we rated out of Aussie ingredients because there were so many of them and for the French Laundry, in a nod to the fine dining side of, well, you know, the fine dining dominance of this book, <laughs> we're going to rate out of five squeezy bottles. bottles. <laughs> so many recipes. He's just like, D make this and put it in a squeezy bottle. How many squeezy bottles do you ha does any home cook have? I have zero. Absolutely none. But yeah, Victoria, how many squeezy bottles are you giving this out of five? Oh, Tom. <laughs> oh Tom it's bad I have to say I'm sorry I know that you're the most decorated chef in the world but unfortunately you don't get any more decor from me so usability and accessibility obviously that that's not it doesn't get a point for that because yeah. it's we talked about it, it's not accessible it's it's not really for the home cook ingredients used again there's a I couldn't find half my stuff I don't have a truffle dealer I don't have a caviar dealer I don't have a pig's head dealer like there's a lot of stuff that 
you can't do. So that's a point off. Aesthetics, I'm giving it a point for aesthetics. It's a beautiful book. It's an interesting shape. <laughs> it looks nice on your dining table, I'm sure. Like it's not going on mine, but I, you know, if you're into that, I'm sure it's lovely. Especially, I suppose, if you've been to the French Laundry, like it's a nice yeah. keepsake to have. Yeah. And some of his little anecdotes are nice. Is it veggie friendly? No, I want to say. Not really, no. Yeah, not there's, a, there's a couple of of hints but like otherwise no like like i said he's in the restaurant he you can get a nine course meal of of vegetarian food but this book for 19.99 wasn't and then am i inspired from it no not at all we know how i feel about french food in general and we've talked about what we feel about fine dining food so those things together like are not the one for me so unfortunately tom i'm sorry but it's actually only one squeezy bottle out of five for me record low sorry actually i'm not sorry like he'll be fine he'll manage he'll cope um how about you similar i tend to be try to want to give points away because i feel a bit bad about things but i don't feel really bad here and that's nice yeah (laughs) good good for you that's growth (laughs) that is growth i am only gonna give points for aesthetic and maybe like half a point for it. Oh, I mean, I just don't know. I was going to give half a point for veggie friendliness because there are some things, mm. but um, let's say like a quarter point for veggie <laughs> oh, friendliness. A quarter. And a quarter point for inspirability in that it's like forces you to think in a different way about food, but it doesn't inspire me to cook. I'm just being generous. I'm giving a token half point so that I can give one and a half squeezy bottles. <laughs> <out of five. laughs> I but yeah, there's, the ingredients are too hard. The, the accessibility is not there. Yeah. And yeah, I just I kind of want to sell the book. Yeah, me too. Does anyone want it? Have we sold it enough to you guys? <laughs> giving it away sorry tom but thanks for your yeah. hard work the past four years yes i mean keep doing what you're doing you're obviously making loads of cash and that's working for you we'll keep, yeah. we'll keep uh, making our free podcast here and judging from afar <laughs> exactly also he was recently in trouble for being on a board that trump set up so we can just not feel bad yeah no him wolfgang park danielle blue i'm disappointed in all of you lads yeah anyway the next, next cookbook, cookbook however tell us we're still in in the u.s yeah i think and <laughs> should hopefully be a lot more accessible and easy to navigate and it's surely this has to be the oldest book that we've done it's been in print since 1936 holy fuck yeah and this book is the joy of cooking Ooh. by irma s rombauer i'm excited i thought this one's gonna be a change of pace from french laundry sold more than 18 million copies that's insane whoa yeah i'm really looking forward to this i think my mom has a copy of this but i don't remember looking through it it hasn't arrived yet for either of us i don't mm. think so we're we haven't looked through it so no we're going to be coming at this very fresh <laughs> i'm excited i'm excited to, you know put this one behind me and move on to bigger and better things um <laughs> if we can find any of old tommy's recipes we will add them to the website i just don't yeah maybe we haven't sold them to you and that's fine but it's fine you can have a look at them on the website and maybe you're you know more gung-ho about these things than us <laughs> <laughs> maybe get your pipettes and squeezy bottles and tweezers out and just have yeah. a wild time and please sign up to our new monthly newsletter which the second one just went out last week and this a little window into our minds which i don't know if you want any more of that but (laughs) it's basically being in vic and i's whatsapp chat and all the links that we send each other being (laughs) like "Ooh." but yeah thank you for listening thank you for listening Bye. bye thanks so much for listening to this episode of the cookbook circle don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and if you've enjoyed it please leave us a review as it helps others to find us you can see how the recipes from this episode turned out on our instagram at cookbook circle And if you make anything from the books we talk about, please don't forget to tag us. See you next time. Bye. Bye.